Well, let's get something really clear at the front. God loves you. God made you. And God wants to live in you. If you get nothing else, I pray that this time of worship and your time in this place, this place of worship, will carry you forward with that message. We're so glad that you're here joining us online here on campus. However you're connecting with us today, thank you for making the worship of God a priority. You know, uh, when I go to a party, I go expecting to have fun, to have a good time. Maybe see some people that I know or meet some new people, enjoy time having fun. Rarely, if never, do I go to a party expecting to die. Now, it just doesn't cross my mind. Don't plan to die. Well, uh, maybe this is the reason why police officers will come and have a formal assembly like this at a school and tell people about the dangers of uh, driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs to have a serious conversation with people who might not think about where their fun might lead. You know, maybe this is even why companies will pay money to bring in a crashed car. I'm, I'm sure you've seen this, haven't you? Maybe around the time of the senior prom to bring in a crashed car that's just ready for scrap metal and to place it there in a perfectly joyous school lobby to get people's attention. Now that's where he sat. Those are the windows that they went out of. And it brings this sense of gravity, a shaking gravity. And it can shake you to your core. I don't know if you've ever gone to a party or had a premonition that something bad was going to happen. Maybe you knew that someone you didn't like was going to be there. Maybe there was some threat, uh, either a person or in the location, and you just knew you shouldn't go. Do you go anyway? I mean, I, I guess you go if you've got something of a death wish, if you don't mind letting whatever happen to you. Well, this rather graphic and emotional kind of picture that I'm pointing for you is something of the shift that happens this week on Palm Sunday, where we celebrate and sing out King Jesus, Hosanna, all the way to the shift that happens at the end of the week, where people are ready to crucify Jesus and to string him up on a man-made cross. That shift is kind of like this, where Jesus is going to a party to celebrate this group of people that's saying he is king, he is the one. They're ready to lay everything down, clothes, palm branches, whatever they can do to pave the way for the king. The best place that we can come up with of a first century red carpet for Jesus. But Jesus goes to that party knowing that that parade and that celebration will be something of a funeral dirge for him. The last time they're celebrating for him. To know that the nails will come, the cross will come. Well, th this is Holy Week. This is the week that we walk through that's, that's our week as Christians. It's a week of, of great celebration, of leading up all of these memories that come to light where Judaism and Christianity share a lot of things. A return to attention to the Exodus. A celebration of Passover. A remembrance of Jesus as he eats the Last Supper, that last Passover with his apostles. And then the gloom. The silence. That sometimes we miss. We sometimes overlook because we jump from the celebration of one Sunday to the Resurrection Sunday of the next to, to, to just dwell for a minute in that silence and in that pain and in the darkness of wondering what will happen with Jesus having died. I mean, it's our story. This is our time. A time where parties lead us to passion, where joy and tears unite together. And it's a time when we should walk with Jesus in this time of betrayal and abandonment by his own friends. Well, I don't know how best you capture a, an event like this. I mean, it's really hard. Sometimes you have to reach out to the realm of poetry or of music or the arts. And that's kind of where we're going today. 
Because whenever you deal with poetry, you're talking about communicating mystery and transcendent truth and beauty and doing it in a few words, obscure words. And that brings us to the song that I want to share with you today that Paul reveals to us. And if you're able to, I'm going to invite you to stand either on your feet or in your hearts to hear this message from Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, didn't regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him, gave him the name that's above every other names, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let the church say, Amen. You can be seated. It takes a poem, it takes a song like this one for us to even begin to imagine what it is for God to empty God's self. Think about it. God becoming human is a crazy thought of emptiness. God becoming not just human, but thought of as a slave, a servant of all, that's mind-blowing. What about a God in the form of Jesus that would choose willingly to be called a criminal, to not speak up on his own defense, and to be willing not just to be accused, but to be killed for crimes? That's a wild story. That's something of a decline that we cannot imagine, and it captures the mystery of what God is up to in just a few words. I just, I don't understand it. I mean, even a cross, that he subjected himself not just to death, but death on a cross. Do you realize we don't do that anymore? That's cruel and unusual. We could not have that kind of a death penalty today, period. Nor should we. And yet, this is the path that Jesus took. This is the orientation towards us that Jesus selected. In a lot of ways, what Jesus does is reverse the curse. All of the evil that we bring into this world as we turn our backs on God and turn away from God came to us through Adam. And Adam didn't have a corner on the market. We humans are pretty good at messing things up. And what Jesus does is reverse the curse. He he flips what happens in the Garden of Eden. If you think about it, you have Adam, who is created in the image of God. He is a child of God. With Jesus, we have the Son of God, where the divine being takes on human form. In Adam, we have someone who is willing to reject and turn back on God. To say, "Ah, I'm going to, would like to kind of be my own God. Is that okay? Jesus didn't claim to be God. He was God in the flesh, in the form of Jesus Christ. You know, this story of reversing the curse, this desire that Adam has, maybe gets most expressed in the disobedience. Where the disobedience that Adam brought, that we bring every day, don't we? That disobedience leads us to death. It leads to our own decline. And with Jesus, he takes that death and turns it, transforms it, flips it, where his death is for our behalf, opening up the kingdom of God, opening up access for you and I to live with God right now, for God to take up residence in our being. Now, the way Paul talks about it is to to use a word that I want to give your attention to, He mentions it three times in this chapter 2. In verse 5, we read that we're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Some versions are going to say 
attitude of Christ. Now, there are a lot of ways that we could talk about this. In fact, if you look at verse 2, there's another place where this shows up twice. And different versions translate the word differently. I want to read you verse 2 of chapter 2 because I didn't read it as part of our sermon text. Paul says, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Did you hear that? Being, having the same love, being full accord and of one mind. There it is again. Now, if you've got the NIV, it will translate that second one as purpose. But included in there is twice, three times if you count verse 5, a mentioning of us having this mind of Christ. What is that? To have the mind of Christ is to have the attitude of Christ. To have the disposition that Christ has. This way of thinking that Christ showed to us is to be ours. Even if you want to go as deeply as feelings, to have this feeling that was in Christ, this is our aim. It's what our purpose is all about. And Paul uses that word all through this little letter. In chapter 1, he mentions it. In chapter 3, he spends some time kind of bragging on his credentials and who he is. And you think, okay, who is this guy? He's bragging about his credentials. And then he says in verse 15 of chapter 3, but all of this, this I consider rubbish, trash, nothing compared to having the mind of Christ. And he says to us, have that same maturity, that same mind. And then chapter 4, when he tries to get two people that are squabbling in a community of faith together, he tells them, have the mind of Christ. Now, this, this makes sense to us, but it's mind-boggling. It makes sense to us as Christians because we understand that God came to us. He was willing to leave heaven and have this distance from us to be in us, to be among us and around us. What can we learn from this attitude of Christ? Well, I'd say plenty. There's a lot that we can learn from having the mind of Christ. That we can learn that our life is preparing us in some way for our death. And then we're not just preparing for more and more success or more and more accolades or more and more of whatever we might say is an achievement or something that would increase our personal fan club. That's not it. Our aim is to take on the mindset of Christ where the church is to find itself out in the world embodying this disposition, having this mindset, this way of looking at other people. At first, Christian, we're a group of people that follow Jesus. And Jesus found himself to be one out in front of us, going out ahead of us, leading the way in having this disposition. And so at first, Christian, we gather for worship like this. We, we have classes and groups, occasions where we are focusing our disposition, preparing ourselves to have this mind of Christ. Now, one thing you need to know is that Jesus didn't just come to this world to get people to come to church. In Matthew 28, he doesn't just say, go into the world and get people to come into church. That's a good thing, being at church. But what he says is, go into all the world to make followers, make disciples of me. That's what he's about. And church is a very important part of that because it's where the followers gather together. But the important thing is that this place where we're at right now is not the main event. This is practice. This is preparation where we're able to put on this mind of Christ. My sister used to coach soccer a lot and uh, she has a real dry sense of humor and she's really point blank with people and there was a person on her team that was always late for practice, missed practice, rarely made it to any of the games, gets towards the end of the season, shows up, and the, the player just kind of casually is mentioning to Kelly, you know, I'm probably our best player. Kelly says, no, you're not. No, no, you're not. You're never here. You don't come to practice. You're late. You miss games. You are not our best player. 
Sometimes people think that just showing up for the games is what it's all about, when in reality, this is the locker room. This is where we equip one another for our life that's lived outside of these walls, where just like any performer in a play or in a concert, any band, there is a lot of practice that takes place, a lot that's invested to create those muscle memories to be who we want to be. And we don't want to confuse our practice with the performance of what this looks like in our own life. As we are really and truly getting ourselves prepared to die. To take that disposition out into the world. Th this little song teaches us something about lordship and about followership. Just a tiny little hymn called the Christ hymn teaches us who our Lord is. This is the one that we serve. We follow Jesus. And it also teaches us about followership, what we are about, what we're doing. We're following Jesus. That's our identity, pure and simple. Jesus who let aside his status of being one with God and came and brought that oneness with God down to us showing us a path, a path of obedience, a path of suffering, a path where it's definitely beginning in an attitude, a disposition, a mindset, a feeling where we are focused on having this attitude of Jesus Christ. Well, that's why I think out in that real world, that's outside the doors back there, that I think Christians are to be the best workers, I don't think we need to have to explain anything to anyone. We should be the best at whatever we do, working hard, where people know that we're honest and dependable and on time, that we're committed, that we're willing to help out and pitch in. Christians should be the best workers. In fact, I think Christians should have the best families. Now, I don't mean the most perfect families. I mean, have you seen our families? We, we don't have it all together, not at all. No, what we have is a disposition, a mindset that informs us. So these best families that I'm talking about, it's not just, well, we're teaching our kids how to eat peas. A very important thing, by the way, to eat your peas. I had to learn to do it. It's a valuable practice. Now we're not just learning to eat vegetables, but we're learning how to have peace and how to be a person of peace in the world. We're not just a group of parents and families where we're focused in on, well, how athletic you are or how academic you are. We're not just focused on extracurriculars or how artistic you are. No, these things are important, but we're trying to impress upon our kids, upon those that we have influence over, this disposition, this mindset of Christ who though he was in the form of God, didn't exploit it, didn't hang on to it. So that means when we teach things like sharing toys, we're not just teaching sharing toys. We're teaching having the mindset of Jesus Christ. Now, learning how to die, that's kind of tough business. I mean, if, if Jesus Christ for you is Lord, it's something that you're either going to confess now or later. I'll just give you a little tip, a little insight. If Jesus Christ is Lord for you, you, you've got already the most important piece of information that's out there in the world. Because if you are connected to Jesus, Romans 6, 5 will say, if we've been united with Christ in a death like his, we will be united in a resurrection like his. This disposition changes us. And it's, it's not just simply something that defines us by our altitude, how far, far we climb, how high we climb, how successful we are. But it's an attitude and a disposition that changes us. Okay, well, we got to do a little gear shift in the car. Well, what does this look like? I mean, it's a song. Well, what, is dispos what have you been saying, Brady? Disposition, attitude, mindset. Well, what does that look like? How, how do we do that? Well, today I want to give you two practices. It's really just one, but two different ways that you could direct this practice that will allow you to practice having the disposition of Jesus Christ. 
It's something that you can try in, in your work or with your family or with an important relationship that you have. A really a way for us to get down and earthy with what it means to have the mindset of Christ. If we're going to have this aspect of humility, we need to understand that Christ was very much humble. But he wasn't a doormat. He's not calling you to lay down and lose yourself, your personality, your gifts, who you are. He's calling you humbly to take all of that together and gather it up in Christ and offer it to others. Humility is like Christ. It's having strength under wraps. It's not always apparent, but it's hidden. And you make use of that strength for the benefit of other people. So, here's what this looks like. As you think about your own life, I want you to look for an opportunity this week. This week to see this thing in particular. Let me press period for a second. A lot of you may have been giving stuff up for Lent, giving things up over these five weeks as an exercise of identifying with what God has given up. And some of you, like me, maybe have not. My wife instructed me that I couldn't give anything up this year because I'd already given up a ton. I'm on a diet that an ant would laugh at. Right? So she said, no, no, you're, you're doing reverse Lent this year. Well, if you're like me and you haven't been on this journey of, of giving things up, this is your opportunity. All right? So we're picking this back up, this one practice. I want you to look for a time this week when someone is oh, maybe disagreeing with you, maybe saying that you're wrong. And you have proof. You, you know that you are right. Okay? Look for this opportunity. And I want you to not defend yourself. Not pull out your written documentation. Not go into a verbal description of how you are right. I want you to not defend yourself at all. And then, pay attention. Pay attention to what's going on inside of you. Because you will likely be like a balloon. I don't even need a needle to pop you. I could just get close to you. <laughs> You're ready to share what you've got. Pay attention to what's going on inside of you by not defending yourself. Maybe even think about what that's teaching you about God and God's humility, God's strength under wraps. Does that make sense? You're looking for an opportunity when you know you are right, but you choose not to defend yourself. You choose to let it sit. That is a chance for us to, to channel the very mind of Christ. Well, maybe you want to try that one. Here's the same practice a little bit different. Maybe you want to direct this towards another person. I want you to look for someone who's different than you this week. Maybe they're different from you because they think differently politically. Maybe they are uh, different in a different social class than you. They're in a different rank than you at work. Different race, whatever it is. Different orientation. Someone that's different from you. And I want you to at some point represent their view. Let them be heard. Defend them. Not because you think that they're right, but maybe even using something that happens in debate a lot. If you've ever been in debate, you know that you have to choose one point or the other and, and build a case about it. But in order to choose one point, you also have to be able to represent that alternative view very well. Right? To be able to say that view so well that the person would say, well, yes, that's, that's, ex that's what I think. Thank you. So you represent someone, but then you don't let it go any further than that. Does that make sense? You're directing it towards someone else. Not that we don't want to directly confront things that, or support things that are evil. That, that's not the point. This is a practice, a temporary practice for you to see what's going on inside of you so that, in a small way, we can channel the mindset of Christ. So that we can orient ourselves to the kind of attitude that God had through Jesus. It's one practice that can transform us. And I have to warn you, it's difficult. In fact, it's even deadly. Don't try this as a party trick. I mean, you really could end up dead. You need to think thoughtfully about where you try this out. 
but it's an exercise in seeing what's going on inside of you. You know, this sermon, this text, is not meant to be a scary, wrecked car. It's not meant to be a threat, like sometimes happens around prom, of what could happen. In fact, it's a description of how Jesus went through this week. It's a description of Christ. And his move from the palm branches of praise to the passion and suffering of a wooden cross that he died on alone. And if we're followers of Jesus, we need to find ways to follow Jesus in that disposition. To have the mindset that he had. Because it's already been given to us in Christ. And to begin our li to live our lives from that mindset. Let's pray. God, you are our God, and earnestly we seek you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water, we thirst for you. In a challenging sermon like this, Father, that really makes us look at you and the disposition the mindset, the attitude, the way of thinking that was present in Christ really is challenging to our everyday life. And so we ask you, we invite you to give us this mindset. That as we attempt to, to do these practices this week, that you'll, you'll show us something about who you are, something about who you're calling us to be. We thank you for Jesus, for the life that we are able to follow. We thank you that we can be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we call on you in this holy week leading up to the celebration of Easter that we will enter it at every level. Not just the joy that's at either end, but the suffering and the pain and the alienation that's in the middle. And God, we look forward to the world that you are creating. A world that you're creating one person at a time through us. And so we ask that you do this miracle on our lives today through Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.